Um, this roundtable has been organized in honor of World Theater Day today, March 27, which in Iran is celebrated as National Dram Dramatic Arts Day. Uh, I'm Marjan Musavi from Roshan Institute for Persian Studies at University of Maryland, College Park. And um, we are so happy to have you all and welcome you. Today's roundtable is also in response to the ongoing uprising in Iran known as Woman Life Freedom Movement. It's been possible by the support of Roshan Institute for Persian Studies, Dr. Fatima Keshavarz, Chair and Director, and my, and my colleague, John Molan. Also, Dr. Magda Romanska and her wonderful team at theatertimes.com, uh, the University of Maryland School of Theater, Dance and Performance Studies, specifically Dr. Kathleen Marshall and Dr. Frank Hildy. And lastly, Vijay Matthew and Theo Rogers from HowlRound and our ASL interpreters from Pro Bono ASL. The event is being live streamed on HowlRound and its recording will be accessible later on. Today, I'm honored to be joined by Dr. Keshavarz, the chair and director of Roshan Institute at Persian Studies at University of Maryland, who will share some remarks with us soon. I'm also honored to have this conversation with our dear panelists, Dr. Azadeh Ganje, former professor at the University of Tehran, performance artist, playwright, and director, and currently a research fellow at the University of Hildesheim, Germany. Also Nassim Soleimanpour, the award-winning playwright and theater maker known globally for his highly acclaimed play, White Rabbit, Red Rabbit, and the artistic director of Berlin-based theater company, Nassim Soleimanpour Productions. And Kevan Sarreshte, playwright, dramaturg, translator, and lecturer based in Iran, actively involved in theater projects done between Iran and Europe. Uh, my colleague will share the full bios in the chat section for your attention. In terms of the format, we will begin with an introduction that gives us a brief historical and political background of Iranian theater and the current movement. We will then move on to discuss uh, some questions that we have prepared in advance. At the end um, of the panel, we will open up for Q&A. Please wait until the end to write your question in the chat box. To begin, I would like to invite Dr. Keshavar to say a few words. Thank you, Majan. Um, it, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here with all of you. Um, uh, first of all, happy Theater Day. Um, it's great to know that we have such an international celebration of, of theater and we're participating in that. Um, I would like to welcome our distinguished panelists. It's a pleasure to have you all on board with us. And I would like to thank Marjan for all the efforts she put, I should actually say Dr. Musavi to be formal, but <laughs> it's rather difficult with colleagues that you work with day in and day out and get inspired by. So I, I refer to her as Marjan, I'm sure she will forgive me for that. I would also like to thank the Department of Theater, uh, Dance and Performance Studies uh, for being such a partner with us as we venture into uh, learning about and introducing Iranian theater and by extension also Middle Eastern theater. So um, if you're hearing me, saying that Roshan Institute for Persian Studies is not here just for this one event, but is actually starting to develop serious um, academic, both at the digital level, as well as academic and performance level, as well as accepting graduate students into our programs in theater, you are hearing me correctly. And so that is really um, a pleasure. Um, the, the role of cinema in Iranian culture is much better known worldwide and maybe even within the country itself. Very um, few uh, non-specialists would know that theater is much older and has played a role in, in, in nurturing just the art of performance and many master um, figures in Iranian cinema 
find their origins in Iranian theater. Now, there are much better scholars of theater here on this panel, so I'm not going to venture to say any more about uh, theater and really look forward to hearing from them. Um, just a, um, a point to say, it is a great pleasure to um, come around and acknowledge this and dedicate the resources and strength to Roshan Institute to um, making this foundational art uh, better known both in the United States and beyond as it is fortunately now possible. Now you all know about the recent uprisings in Iran and many of you may not know that there have been many other uprisings almost every couple of years. Um, the people of Iran have looked for opportunities to express their desires for living in a um, democratic secular environment in which they're able to respect other people's religion, but also be respected and acknowledged for their own personal belief or disbelief as the case may be. And the most recent has been the uprising of women like freedom, Zanzandegi, Azadi, and many people may not know what the role theater has played, not just in um, echoing the voices of this uprising, but in educating generations who have come to put together the uprising. In other words, the learning opportunity, the educational opportunity next to artistic um, achievements, which are always really locked together um, is something that hopefully will become much better known recently. So uh, involved with efforts like this and beyond. So on that note, um, I'll leave you with Dr. Marjan Musavi and the distinguished panelists. And I look forward to listening to all of you and learning about Iranian theater. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Keshavars. Um, so let me go right to the introductory remark that I have um, prepared. Uh, the new millennium has witnessed a significant rise in social and political activism and protests all over the world, to the extent that we can call our time the age of protests and movements. In the last 15 years, Iran has been no exception in terms of um, having an upsurge of social and political protests. The controversial result of the 2009 presidential election led to a series of nationwide protests known as the Green Movement, which became a major event in Iran's modern political history. In 2017, young women began a series of activist projects protesting compulsory hijab by unveiling in public and sharing their selfies on social media. This was followed by mass protests as a result of soaring fuel prices in 2019. More recently, since mid-September 2022, the death of Mahsa Gina Amini, a 22-year-old Kurdish girl, while in Tehran police custody for wearing an improper hijab, has triggered the largest and most sustained civil uprising since the 1979 revolution. Borrowing the Kurdish slogan, Jean, Jean Jian Azadi, the movement is now known as the Woman Life Freedom Movement. Waves of protests in more than 160 cities and towns, mostly led by women, factory workers, and students, called for accountability for Mahsa's death and also for all other forms of oppression. The Twitter hashtag Mahsa Amini broke the world record with over 284 million tweets sent. The protests also resulted in extraordinary international support and a UN Human Rights Commission voted on November 24th to investigate the regime's deadly repression, which has led to the death of 500 protesters, thousands of arrests, and four executions. Woman Life Freedom Movement is described as an intersectional movement that fights not only for women's rights, but also for a democratic secular government, freedom of expression, and equality for religious, ethnic, and gender minorities. As I'm talking to you, it seems that the state suppression and the protests are experiencing exhaustion. Uh, 
But the uprising does not seem to be ending. Many believe Iranian society is on a revolutionary course and that its political consciousness has changed forever, meaning many Iranians continue to think, imagine, talk, and act for a different future. Globally speaking, what connects all of these movements and protests are perceived injustices that injustices regarding abuse of power and the flaws in contemporary political practice. Another point of connection that is globally shared by these movements is their conscious use of theatrical gestures, which offer powerful methods of nonviolent intervention. Both theater and protest, despite their limits, generate nonviolent uh, processes of envisioning alternative reality with a view to the future. In this sense, they are closely connected and mutually influential. In the case of the Women Life Freedom Movement, perhaps what distinguishes its waves of protests from the previous ones is that they're often accompanied by an area of creative and performative acts of nonviolent protests, both in the streets and in digital space. Some examples of such civil disobedience in the streets include burning compulsory veils, dancing through traffic, cutting hair in public, and drawing political graffiti. In digital space, protesters create and share innovative digital art and socially engaged pop songs like Baraye, while also sharing posts, hashtags, and playful slogans on social media. A remarkable feature shared by many of these protests is that as performative acts, they affirm the productive intersection of theater and protest. Let's now turn to the main question of today's panel. How has Iranian theater responded to the current and previous political movements? Historically, in their relentless quest for social justice, equality, and freedom, and in the face of state censorship and biased facts and narratives, theater artists in Iran never stopped performing plays in support of political movements and in the name of protest. Similar to social activists, they use a wide array of creative interventions for defiance, provocation, transgression, reality bending, and prefiguration, all aiming at creating visions of reality and visions of future and multiple um, identities on a stage. A commitment also emphasized by Samiha Ayu, the Egyptian theater artist in her recent message for 2023 World Theater Day. Although at times working with a kind of uncertain hope, Iranian theater artists found themselves ethically responsible to propose to the world a model of reality that reimagine how to interact and how to be. Iranian theater now has a rich repertoire of realistic confrontational theater, presenting a vivid and truthful depiction of the religious ambivalence and moral dilemma that Iranians deal with in their everyday lives. In recent years, several women playwrights worked in documentary theater to address matters of public concern and interpersonal tensions by dramatizing untold stories and hardships of Iranians' youth value crisis and the struggles of homeless women, refugees, and transgender people. Iranian artists have also developed community-based forms of theatrical intervention by either taking performance to underprivileged communities, for example, Afghan immigrants and women in shelters, or by involving them in their performance and conventional stages. Returning to the current Woman Life Freedom Uprising, a brilliant example of a protest performance is one that took place last November from a collective of 16 theater artists led by Sohela Golestani and Hamid Purazari. The collective performed a 53 second spine chilling silent performance in a park in Tehran. All the actresses appeared unveiled and stood still and silent to the end of the performance. They then shared the video of the performance on their social media. Of course, this led to their temporary arrest. Examples of plays and performances that make structures of power and control visible and subject their values to question are numerous in Iranian theater repertoire. It might seem too soon to expect a remarkable and robust engagement from Iranian theater artists with the Woman Life Freedom Movement. But for a movement that has the word life at its center 
and for a theater that is committed to reimagining and creating an alternative reality on its stage, having conversations like the one we have today seem very timely and hopefully productive. So today we have gathered to discuss the convergences and divergences between theater and protest in the current context of Iran. We also hope to go beyond that to discuss the role of theater as a reflection of and for reality building, equality and transformation. Let me start with a rather general question addressed to all of the panelists. Um, how would you describe theater which aims to protest and defy, particularly in the context of Iran? What are its main features and conditions? Um, shall we start with Azadeh or Nassim? Hi, I say hello to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, an honor of mine. And I would like to congratulate the War Theater Day while I would like to remember Hossein Mohammadi, an actor who is still in falsely imprisoned in Iran. And I would really wish for uh, a day of justice and for him to come back on a stage. And I would like to um, remind all of us of all the actors, actresses, theater makers, artists who have been actually suffered during all these years uh, due to censorship and oppression and all other um, uh, methods of uh, tyranny. And so to answer your question, I would like to say, I think about uh, what actually theater makers in Iran uh, published uh, publicly on social media after uh, what happened, uh, which I would like to call Jina uprising or Jina revolution or woman life freedom movement. Um, there was a manifest that they published and in this manifest they mentioned uh yeah three main um wishes or missions for theater in iran uh which was i won't perform on a stage where women or men are forced to perform in hijab thereafter my productions won't stage uh, bodies and imposed atmospheres bodies which can't be free on stage. I will try to stage the reality of life. Mm -hmm. The other one was in loyalty to freedom. I won't give in to censorship in any condition, any format, any time, any place, and any government or state. And I think this manifesto, as they mentioned, is not a suicidal end to their artistic life, despite, the, despite being totally against all the rules of a state in Iran for performing. Rather, it's they tried to make themselves free and they tried to mention what the performing arts should be after this revolution, after this uprising. Um, so I think one answer to this question, trying to be the voice of uh, theater makers inside from my side would be that one. But I would like to hear others, uh, especially Kayvan and uh, Nassim idea. Kevin, I think you have more to say. I mean, it's woman life freedom. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I feel like I'm I'm the fifth wheel here because I'm, I'm among these ladies and Kevin lives in Iran. So I, I try to give you my 20, 20 cents at any point, but I would also be curious to hear what Kevin has to say. Uh, hi, hello, everyone. Uh, well, it's... Uh... It's it's a hard question to answer because uh, historically theater and uh, culture and what we call intellectual uh, sector has been uh, kind of uh, always had this uh, feeling of having the answers or knowing uh, or being one step ahead of 
uh, social issues or political issues. And, but at the same time, uh, in the context of uh, official performances, official theater, uh, things that we know or people in, on the street know as theater, it has been very, very uh, regulated. It, you need to go and show your text. You need to go and book a space that needs permission from the government agency, and you need to have permission to sell your tickets. You need to have approval of the things you do on the stage. So uh, these formal restrictions have always been there. And at the same time, there's there has always been these playful uh, trials of artists to defy these. Uh, to say things that are not really acceptable, to uh, try to move one step uh, closer to that uh, red line that you're not, you, you are not allowed to cross. But in the past uh, six months, uh, more than six months, which is unbelievable, uh, things have changed, as you said, and things have changed in a way that that seemed uh, impossible before because uh, I'm talking about myself. Uh, we, when I say we, I'm talking about myself and a very small uh, sphere of people around me. So I'm not generalizing it, but we uh, couldn't imagine that future, that other future in the official spaces. So we took our, uh, productions, we took our work and tried to find new spaces for it. Mm -hmm. But now we are thinking that we should take the space back. We are thinking that we should stand up and say that this is, as Azad said, uh, this is our manifesto. We are not going to perform in that way anymore. And we are not going to stop performing. So we are not hiding anything. We are not leading that double life anymore. So that's uh, that's very strange for us to think about it because it's almost mission impossible, but uh, it's something that we don't think there's any other way uh, and we don't think that we can go back. So I don't know how it's going to be, but I know it's going to be a challenge and at the same time, something very new. This is this is wonderful. I mean, we are always happy, uh, you know, talking about the mutually constitutive relationship that Iranian artists, you know, um, have built with the government in, you know, the sort of compromises that they have been making in the last four decades and um, the theater that they have produced um, wanted to be in, you know, all those regulatory frameworks. And at the same time, wanted, as you said, to push the boundaries, you know, to, to examine actually the limits, how much um, these limits can be questioned, you know? But now that um, within this last six months, as I said, I think that not even the whole Iranian society, but the Iranian theater and theater artists also have came to this understanding that we want uh, bigger changes. We, they are seriously on a revolutionary sense, both I think ethically and um, practically, but, I mean, I, I would say my next question would be, what are some plans and strategies if it's not too early to ask? You know, I'm very curious to um, listen to that. Now that the intention is there, probably the, ne the, quest the next question would be um, how this is possible in practice. Um, I don't know if anyone, any of you want to build on that or go back to the question of, you know, maybe maybe I would like to hear Nassim because Nassim yes. has actually done a great job uh, uh, going around all this censorship, going around even the borders with his special uh, style of theater. So Nassim, I think now it's the time that you are the main will. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, there are two things that comes to my head uh, in general that I, I think I need to share. One is that I want to mention that not the whole history of Iranian theater in the last 40 years uh, was compromising with the censorship. Mm -hmm. We talk about strong, brave women taking off their scarves. 
we have uh, this festival called uh, Iran International Festival of University Theater. And years ago, many years ago, a very famous Iranian actress, she's now more like a movie star, uh, after her ending a show uh, in Molavi Theater, took off her scarf to celebrate and it caused like the extremists to attack, you know, uh, the festival and it became a chaos. So in the course of the Iranian uh, history, uh, when you look at the, the Iranian theater, at some points you feel like it actually has been ahead. So for us who are Iranians and we worked in this business, it might be clear, but it might be interesting for your audience to know that the same amount of censorship has, has could never be applied to theater in comparison with Iranian cinema. That, that allowed Iranian theater to always be a bit more avant-garde. So when we talk about the new movements in, in, in social movements in Iran, I tend to think uh, that at some point even Iranian theater was ahead of these movements by, wh uh, by what Iranian artists wrote or made uh, uh, on stage. That's one thing that I need to mention. Secondly, is that I know we're in the business of defining, and that's the only way our brains work. I tend to remind myself that, that I'm not really interested in doing that. I'm, I'm more interested as an individual, as Kayvon mentioned, to experience this, mm -hmm. not to try to go, you know, what is this theater? I think this theater, the theater that we're talking about, would probably, in my experience, define itself either organically or forcefully by some role play players, most probably to the point that it would turn on its head and become too big to either change the circle of power or dissolve in it. Um, if you look at the West, uh, a, a version of that is commercial theater, where somehow you know you have like uh, the political theater becoming a thing where you buy yeah, a ticket to watch shows on Broadway for 200 or 300. Um, dollars. Um, so, uh, if we agree these, uh, if we accept these two little pillars that I'm trying to put down, then I think uh, our relationship to the topic is more organic. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, personal is okay. It becomes more personal. Um, how you, as an individual, as an artist, are going to react to it to this, uh, and then historically, when you look at it in the hindsight, it would make more sense to go, oh, all these individuals, because I think that is what this revolution is about: is your individuality is now being suppressed by people telling you what to wear, what to do, what to eat, what to drink. But then the common the common uh, interest, I think, in the course of history, would naturally uh, shape itself. That's how I would look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting actually the experimental nature of all these you know, practices. Um, I mean, this is what I have learned that the prefigurative tactics or all these transgressive tactics that artists use are by nature unguaranteed and experimental. Um, and um, it is, I mean, out of this experimentation that, as you said, organically, um, the new, you know, visions and new practices emerge. Um, Kevan or um, Azade, do you have anything to add about all this experimental nature of, you know, the individual works that are, you know, emerging here and there? Uh, I just wanted to add something uh, and mention how both Nassim and Azade uh, through their works and through their uh, interactions with the young generations, uh, both officially in the universities and un unofficially with their friendships and uh, collaborations and things like that, uh, been participants in a very slow but constant change in how theater has been uh, experienced by the younger generation. And uh, in the past 15 years, I think, uh, what we uh, somehow 
called experimental or avant-garde or uh, off-stage theater uh, became a much, much bigger part of the normal uh, repertoire, if we can call it that, of student uh, theater scene. And for example, I think it was in the spring last year, so five months before uh, this uprising started, that in a student festival, we saw a small piece. Uh, it was not officially dance, but it was a dance performance. And it was by a woman student, by a girl of 22, with a performer of 22, a girl. And the performer, the performer, the performance, and the creators were all aware of what they were doing and how it was against everything that was allowed. So they were doing it and they were, it was supposed to have two performances in one day, night and they were doing it and they were thinking, okay, we will do it. And then they will come and tell us to not go do the second performance. And that happened. And us as the audience of that piece, we were not just seeing the art uh, part of the performance. We were seeing the activists uh, in the performer because we were uh, really, really worried about her. We were worried about ourselves, about everything that could happen. But as Nassim said that this uh, theater scene has been some, in some parts of it has been ahead of the social change. We were somehow rehearsing, uh, becoming more brave and becoming more uh, together to see how we are going to do these things outside of the closed rooms of uh, private spaces. We were doing it, we, not I, uh, young students were doing it in the most official space you can imagine, the university and the official festival of the university. So I think these experimental, these uh, marginal, uh, parts of theater are becoming more and more uh, center and they are becoming the, not mainstream because after things that happened 15 years ago to 10 years ago, we have a very big commercial scene in Tehran and Iran that has its own really life, but they are changing how theater is interacting with the society, I think, uh, as a theater person. Uh, at, at least they are uh, having an effect in my reaction, uh, in my relationship, in my interaction with how bodies are seen in streets, in uh, social life, in everyday life. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. You talked about um, these, all these performances, activist performances that put the life and, you know, careers at risk by university students. And I know that um, also the, you have been teaching to some of the most talented students at the University of Tehran. And I'm, I'm, I know about University of Tehran, maybe other universities in Iran. Um, would you like to speak about that experience of both, I mean, working with your students who are working ahead um, and trying to um, you know, be defiant, formally speaking, and also narratively speaking? Yeah, I would I would like to thank Kayvan for mentioning that, um, and also you. Yes, I had the privilege to uh, be next to the young generation, artists, activists, uh, and yeah, elites of the society, but not elites in the term of elites being supported by the state, but uh, a group of young, talented um, artists, activists. And I should mention that although theater was imported to Iran as a, as a tool for uh, the uh, state mm -hmm. to teach its own morality, to teach ethics as, as they wanted, although this happened and although any kind of a state 
through our history of modern theater, wanted to affect theater, wanted to actually uh, control theater through financing and through uh, certificating what should be on the stage, what could be on the stage. But theater always, and performing arts in the broad sense, always uh, acted against this. And as Nasi mentioned, it was always ahead of that. Um, theater, performing arts, uh, never accepted to become a tool of propaganda purely. Yes, it has been used. It has been used by the state. It has been used and it has been thought even in the university to be uh, uh, just a tool for, um, for police, for the state, for laws, for order, and for propaganda in the term of a totalitarian system. But the notion, the nature, of performing arts doesn't accept that. And especially as Kayvon mentioned, the new methods and uh, the more avant-garde theater, more avant-garde performing art uh, events doesn't accept that at all. I should, I should dare to say the very first group of students who started protesting in Iran, just the day, the same day that uh, Masa Jina Amini was buried, where the theater students, where the performing art students of University of Tehran and Art University, Tehran Art University. I should dare to say that what they made during their protest was a very performative act, and it actually showed the potential of performative acts to have a a uh, universal language to be able to speak and of course to be able to make a collective to make a um, community of protesters community of people who are acting for woman life freedom and i think this um this kind of this this mentality of looking at uh, political activism as a way of uh, performing event, performing art event or performative event was very helpful. And this is what I can see in new generation, in the young generation. They acknowledge performing art as a um, space to have freedom, mm -hmm. to speak, to show what they want, uh, from the society, not what society is asking from them, to show their individuality, as, as Nassim mentioned, to show a, a specific kind of aesthetics that they would like to bring on a state, on the stage, sorry, not what the state is asking for, and not even what the conventional methods of theater are asking for. Um, I think going beyond being orthodox, as Kayvon mentioned, which happened during past years in different festivals. And uh, actually I should mention that Nassim and uh, his uh, classmates or the group of alumni that Nassim are from already started it years ago in the University of Tehran in experimental theater festivals. This was an answer to what uh, students felt which it felt is necessary for the society not only for the theater scene, but in the broad sense for the society. And so it's not about be having only political um, topics on the stage. It's about the policy of performing. As, as Kayvon mentioned with this particular performance, a woman dancing in an official stage, although she knows she is in danger, although she knows this is the end of, it could be the end of her career. So it is about the, what you choose as your policy as an artist. Mm -hmm. And I think this has, been, this has been always suppressed, even in the university, but the students themselves keep this fire alive. The students themselves had this among each other. The students themselves tried to reach new sources of knowledge. And actually, they even were able to distance themselves from Eurocentric knowledge. 
I would like to mention that or westernized knowledge. I would like to mention that you can see what they are producing is not um, reproducing or remodeling or going after the models of Eurocentric uh, political art, but they made something new. They made something which can be adjusted to their own situation uh, and to the geography and policy that they are living inside, which I think is very important and it's a, it's a treasure. Right, true, absolutely. So the fact that their context is specific, you always talk about how activist art um, can be processed and received based on the context in response to the, you know, to cultural, political um, ongoing in the context. Um, so that's very important. And the other thing that transpired from um, all of this conversation, if I want to just summarize for now, was the shift that we see. I mean, I used to think that um, political artists, theater uh, artists who want to uh, create um, socially engaged art and political art, they uh, are so, they are now thinking about uh, the, thinking about activating their audiences in terms of the ethics, the ethics of taking responsibility for what is going on. But um, now we see that the ethics is there. Yes, they want to activate their you know, audiences, but at the same time, they also want to reclaim space, especially the, in the public sphere, you know? And um, this, you know, the, the combination of both exercising the ethical self and at the same time trying to reclaim the physical spaces that have been officially policed and controlled, um, I think are the strong conditions that uh, theater artists have been uh, creating for themselves and especially student, university students have been carving for themselves. Um, thank you for that. And before I go on to my next question, I would like to um, hear more about this shift that has happened, you know. Uh, both to the dramaturgy, to the form, and also to the narrative, you know, uh, that we see in the theatrical performances. If any of you want to chime in. Just uh, like quickly say something, I'm not that updated. I, I, yeah, I was, strangely enough, I arrived in Iran um, two weeks before the protests start, supposed to stay only only a few days, but then I, I stayed actually three months as much as I could, uh, but still I'm not that updated. There's a thing uh, about Iranian uh, theater that I've always been obsessed with because maybe that's not how my brain functions. And that is metaphor. You know, when it comes to political theater, we always are metaphorically uh, talking about a king, who did something really nasty and we mean we're talking about someone else. There's always metaphor involved with Iranian political theater. And because maybe I'm a bit slow and maybe because now I lived in Germany over a decade, I always go for like, but why don't we directly say what we want to say? I don't really get it. So that is one big shift that I noticed in conversations and in some of the examples that you guys already gave. A woman uh, dancing on stage is not a metaphor for anything. She is dancing on stage. Or Hamid Pour Azari and, 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 and his friends being in a park, taking off their, their scarves, standing there in, in silence is what it is. It's not like a metaphor, uh, which I think is a big shift. I don't want to bore you. We all know the Iranian classic uh, uh, playwrights who are all legends and we have lots of respects for them. Uh, but yeah, this is this is a thing that has started uh, during uh, the, the actually two generations before, which is like our parents, and now we have uh, younger, very young uh, um, theater makers who are doing it their own way. And that was also happening in conversations. I mean, it it seems to be like a center. Like when we talk about University of Tehran, I've studied there as a day. Uh, taught there, Kayvon has been, so it's like we all lived it over different decades. And at the time when I was a student, we would go for like, yeah, something is not good, we should do something. And half an hour later, we're talking about Jacques Derrida and Sartre and Bart, you know, 
as this time when I was in Iran, everything was really direct, you know? So I was just like sitting with some younger uh, artists and they would like directly go, I'm done with my scarf, you know? And they didn't want to go deep into anything because deep inside they have felt it. They didn't need any references to make it more complicated to understand. It was the agenda, uh, the problem was very clear and you didn't need any metaphors to understand it. And that was so vivid and so beautiful to experience first time for me. That's amazing how confrontational things have become, you know, and this, yeah, this directness in both the ethics, the visions, the aesthetics um, is fascinating. Um, yes, Dr. Keshavars, as a literary scholar, please. Yes. Um, thank you so much for, I know that I'm not supposed to be on the panel, but I couldn't help as Nassim was talking. See, that's what happened with poetry too. When, when you look at the decades prior to the revolution, you have all these metaphors and then you get closer to it. It's about the reality of what is happening there. And I think it is happening again in in poetry as well people are done with metaphors everything is out there clearly speaking for itself and the best we can do is to echo it as it is so it was really exciting to hear that that's that's why i i chimed in thank you for giving me a chance to say that thank you um Kim, i would like to yes. add something um to that not to rob the stage from Kevan or Nassim, but um, because I speak slowly, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so uh, what I think is important in the term of uh, performative definitions or terms is actually people decided to put away their semiotic bodies. And if we look at woman hijab and uh, the hijab on a stage even as a semiotic body, People also decided to put this away and go back to their phenomenal body with the terms of Erika fischer -Lichte. So I, I think, uh, as Nassim mentioned, we don't need, there was no need for metaphors. There is no need for the semiotic body anymore. There is no need for semiotics anymore. I think also the, the recent um, uh, dilemma on the, uh, on uh, platforms about what happened in a, um, a series uh, made in Iran is the same. People don't need things to go undercover. People don't need things to, uh, everything is very naked. Everything is very much staged in the public space that there is no need to hide it. There is no need to push anything on it. Any, any semiotic is actually taking back the empowerment that people got from being in the public space. And this is actually, I think, what also theater is asking for, to go to public space in a free uh, way, to be free, to, to actually break out. And of course, this public space is the conventional stages and it's, it's everywhere. Everywhere could be a stage, we know. I think K1 uh, truly mentioned that, yes, they decided to go out of these conventional spaces, but he mentioned, now we want to get those conventional spaces back too. Why not on the official stages? Why not in theater halls? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe this is also a big change, yes. which is happening for everyone in the society. People don't 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 ask for another body. They 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 know how vulnerable they are, mm -hmm. but they want to show it. They want to be as they are. Thank you, um, Kevin. I want your reaction to this, and also I want to uh, to know how sustained do you think this shift will be in terms of, you know, both aesthetics and narrative? Uh, well, uh, I think what, what we uh, are talking about right now is very uh, important and it can be a turning point because uh, narratively speaking, uh, our theater, uh, our classical uh, 
parts of uh, theater uh, history has been very narrative based, very uh, text based, uh, as everyone probably. And these metaphors, and we have this rich history of poetry, which is really uh, good with metaphors. So uh, we had this uh, this playfulness with words that I'm telling this and you're hearing it, but I can also say that I'm not saying this, so you you can't stop me from saying it. But And then there's this playfulness in content has been somehow tolerated or somehow maybe even uh, accepted by the state and by the artists. It was a it was a game we played and we tried to do it. We tried to do it very good. Each, uh, both parts, the censorship committee tried to uh, decode everything we said and we tried to find new codes that they couldn't decode but the audience could. And these things uh, were really- Endless game, yes. Parts of the, yeah, endless game. But one of the most uh, important differences right now is that it's not about the content anymore. And even the uh, form of the protest, it's taking up uh, your way. It's becoming uh, a body. And there's uh, another slogan that I really find uh, amazing, which I'm, it's hard for me to translate in, in, into English, but it says towards uh, life, towards uh, corporality, I think, and towards a uh, womanhood. And this emphasis on being a body, and that there is no metaphor in being having your body, and you can't put a metaphor on I'm not this. And there's only censorship, or there's only stopping you from doing things. So there was never uh, any, there were. Uh, attempts to metaphorize, for example, kissing on stage. But it seemed stupid and they, we stopped doing it because it seemed stupid. You can't metaphorically kiss someone. So we just said, I kiss you. Mm -hmm. But your form is becoming, your body is becoming the message itself. And that's really hard because sustainable, uh, you talked about how sustainable it is. And the body can be killed, damaged, imprisoned. Uh, the ideas couldn't. The words couldn't. So we could go inside our uh, safe spaces, write something. I'm just going to uh, mention Nazim's play. Uh, he couldn't travel, his words could. But the genius of it was that his words became... Uh, something else in the bodies of another person. Mm -hmm. So we are now in a very special place in our theater history that mm -hmm. our bodies are going to be, because it's going to take a long time, I think. So it's not long maybe, but it's going to take some time. So our bodies are going to be oppressed and our wars are not going to be enough anymore. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? about this and I don't have any answers for that but that's the challenge that's the that's the theater of right now yes. to see how our wars and our bodies can find a place for themselves in this situation absolutely I think the there is this movement and process um embedded in the term pish besuyer in the preposition actually toward you know this becoming is not a one you know night process or thing and um um you're right we are talking about an uncertain hope but there are also you know uh, plenty of uh as uncertainties and also productive moments and momentum that come with all this uncertainty and within these processes which of course take time. Um, thank can you. I, can I, if, yes, if, you, if you don't mind, can I can I say quickly one thing? Yes. yes. I, I really loved when Kayvon said, it's not about content anymore. Yes. I think to, to me, he nailed it. Like when we talk about all these uh, mottos that people shout in the streets, 
Mm -hmm. I'm a writer. I'm obsessed with wordings and, you know, Stop how you pick them. But even if you go, ha, 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 it would work. If I watch the, sh the show that Kayvon is talking about, the dance piece, I don't care how good of a dancer she is. It's not about the content anymore. It's down, down there in the streets. Basic, basic, basic. Your existence denies my existence. You know, that is so primitive now. It's like two wild animals facing each other. So what they say to each other does not matter that much, or at least not at this phase. It's very core, core, core problematic, you know? So I really loved it. I think he nailed it at least for me. I've been trying to find a sentence for my feeling, and I think it works for me because it is somehow not really about the content at this point. Thank you. Um, Could we say that the vulnerability of the body that uh, that Kayron also pointed to, the fact that what is at stake is now so much more, also gives theater so much more power because you know that the body that's dancing on the stage could be in jail the next day. You know that, you know so much is at stake. Um, and I know it's easy for those of us sitting here comfortably saying these things, but I'm just wondering um, how much more theater is doing now by being reduced to the bare um, life that it has, the body that it has, that it, that it's putting forth. I and mean, I, oh, no, 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 I'm, I talked a lot, so you go ahead. No, please. Can I, I mean, I, I'm give you, I'm going to give you my own answer very quickly which is to me, contemporary theater is like a paralyzed kid. You cannot put too much on her shoulder. You need money, you need government to back theater. It might be like little movements every, you know, not like a crazy Nassim Soleiman poor sitting in his room deciding to write a play which travels without him traveling. But in reality, I've been in Sweden for the last three months touring all across the country, visiting 30 cities. And a lot of money was paid and people, you know, backed it. So that it happens. Mm -hmm. So in the long run, my answer would be, uh, yeah, more heartbreaking. I would disagree. I think the, since the last word should be Kayvans, <laughs> um, I would like to say, uh, yes, vulnerability is resistance. And showing your vulnerability, as I also mentioned, is kind of a resistance. Uh, it is about asking for the right of appearance, um, either on stage of theater or on the stage of society. But also, we should think about the potentials. We should think about the limits of that act. There are limits. There are, li there are limited persons. You know, it's not a, it's not an unlimited source of bodies. It's not an unlimited source of lives. And it's not an unlimited source of uh, financial uh, power. It's about people. I think it's a very good moment to get back to this question. Theater, theater makers stopped producing theater for a long, long time right now. Six months is a lot. And there is always this question, should they get back on stage with any circumstances? They don't want to. But what about their lives? What about, uh, because it's not only your financial life, it's also about your career. Yeah, it's also passion. about your identity. Yes. How do you reclaim your identity as a theater maker while you can't get back on stage because you, don't, you have this manifesto? So you don't want to kill your career. You don't want to kill your future. You don't want to kill your body. You are vulnerable. You show resistance, but you need support. And where is this support coming from? Maybe, maybe we say from the audience, 
okay but then this is but then this is also putting audience in danger mm -hmm. and is this what you want i would like to get back to uh, a very performative act uh, like what uh, Ida, uh, like uh, vida movahedi did uh, uh, and these days we hear a, a lot yeah uh, the girls of uh, revolution street uh, i would like to mention that what vida movahedi did was never putting her audience in danger she did a self-suicidal act, but she was very cautious. She was very careful about the uh, security of her audience. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? It's, it's a question I ask myself. It's a question I think uh, which I, I, I it's, it's something which could be discussed uh, inside the theater circle, inside the performing arts circle in the country. Um, but at but at the end, it's a very personal decision. Since first of all, because artistic activism is very very personal. The other reason is we don't have really very powerful guilds for theater makers in Iran. The uh, yeah, the, the the society, the association we have is actually dependent on the uh, government, on the state. So it is, it is very hard to actually take care of each other. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to mention. Yeah, and I just wanted to say that with all its limits, I just want to highlight that, you know, the strong engagement, both intellectual and emotional engagement that happens at, that direct, you know, experience, you know, how, ephem no matter how ephemeral it is, I think this directness and inviting the audience to bear witness, you know, to what's going on, no matter how temporary and short it is, um, it creates um, the a lasting impression. And this is what we actually want. I mean, theater artists, not me exactly, I'm not a researcher, really want to invest on, you know, that direct um, moments of encounter, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, space, of course, has become very critical. And um, now I want OK one to comment on that, both the space and also the, we, we, I remember we talked about the limitations actually, especially for artists working outside of Tehran, you know, in other cities. If you would, uh, I mean, if you add to yeah, that, sure. I'd have uh... I'm just going to uh, continue what uh, Nasima and Azad were saying because I agree with what they were talking about, and I have to acknowledge that I'm I'm, I'm probably probably not the right person, even though I'm right now in Tehran. I'm not the right person to talk about this thing because I'm the privileged one. I can work in, for example, international scene. I have I have had time to create that career that is not dependent on uh inside iran situation i'm also a translator so that i can live my life by just doing translations even if i'm banned i can do it on another name i can do uh business translations i i can do that and i'm privileged and i i have to be aware of that there are people there are assistant directors that have not worked for the past six months and uh in the pandemic time for maybe most part of the past three years. And it's a long time. And they are doing a lot by not doing anything. They're doing a lot by not participating in this. So, and the problem, or maybe, I don't know if it's the problem, but maybe it's a characteristic of theater is that it can only happen at that moment, as you said, at that, yeah, it can have a very profound effect at that moment. But to how many people? Let's imagine the city theater, 700 people. I go there, I stand on the stage, I do something that is revolutionary. And after 30 minutes, I will be gone. And those 700 people will never, uh, can never reproduce what they uh, experienced. 
it's not like the pop musics that uh, you mentioned in your speech that can uh, go viral. Theater happens at that time. And the limited amount of bodies, the limited amount of people, the limited amount of spaces that can be closed, that can be imprisoned, that can be uh, even controlled uh, means that it's not pessimistic, it's just realistic. That theater is not the main area of activity inside this, uh, for me at least, it's my idea. It's inside this situation. Maybe theater planted some very, very old seeds that are now, we are seeing it in the figurative uh, concept of this uh, uprising. Maybe theater students learn things that they are now putting to use. But having this uh, idea or this expectation of theater to become part of the anti-state uh, machine that is producing works while this production needs bodies, needs real presence is, I think, a little bit unfair. And it's not uh, unfair from the outside. It's unfair from the inside, too, because in the first few months of the uprising, uh, we had some uh, we had some talks with students, with young people, with uh, people older, and they were they were angry. We were angry at ourselves that music is doing this, uh, video artists are doing that, and what are we doing? Why are we not participating in this? What is theater good for if we can't do anything right now? And I. I don't believe, right now, I don't believe that's the right question to ask. Mm -hmm. Maybe theater uh, has ideas about other places that can uh, have effect, not just theater in itself, because that is the place that can be really controlled. Good or bad theater can be, the traditional sense of theater can be completely controlled. Even mm -hmm. Hamid Purazari and Soila Golestani did something that is not considered theatrical in any of the old school uh, terms. Absolutely, yeah. Well, for a, actually, it was one of my questions that for a theater enmeshed in you know systems of control, financial problems, the, the crippling economic sanctions that um, the whole Iranian economy is experiencing, the adversaries of post COVID, you know having high expectations of a theater to be, that is, as I said, in, that is so much enmeshed in all these systems of control and limitation, and uh, maybe it's too much. Um, but we see that all these powerful performative acts are going on, you know, in various spaces and the magic of liveness, you know, and and the, the rehearsal actually, that rehearsal that you were talking about, Kayvon, about, you know, the exercising, um, the, the agential power, the uh, trying to create uh, carve spaces and uh, practice, you know, the ethical responsibility is something that has been going on even before um, the, the Roman life freedom movement. Um, I think Azad has been defying all these, you know, conventional spaces in her forum performances, you know, in Tehran, various spaces in Tehran. Um, and Hamid Purazari also has been doing that. Um, with that, I think we pretty much we covered the key points that we wanted to discuss. Is there anything you want to add before we move on to the Q&A? Any um, final comments? I just wanna quickly say a thing, if that's okay, is, is the, the frustration, the feeling that Kayvon is talking about has also been with me. I I was there, you know, and I was acting cowardly as a foreigner who had to go back to his home, you know, and all the things. And I've been trying for a few months. Uh, I'm sure, Kayvon, there are millions of answers to, to this question that, okay, what are we good for in theater? As many as good uh, artists could live on this planet Earth. I'm just going to give you my my answer to myself. Maybe it helps you feel like <laughs> a bit better. I think there are things that you look when you look at uh, uh, historical events. 
some of it is being covered by BBC, you know, they cover some stuff and then scholars come in, they write about all the things and the numbers, scientists, we have all these things. And if you deduct all of that from the core event, something is there. When we talk about COVID, no one in BBC talks about these two guys who were supposed to go on a date and now they had to wear a mask and they couldn't hold hands, you know, and they couldn't kiss or whatsoever. So this is where theater comes in. To me, this is where you are there, you lived it, you are living it, you've observed it, you've absorbed it, and it would naturally be in your system. So two months later, two years later, 20 years later, it will come out mm -hmm. and you write something and maybe even you don't even think it's any related to what you've experienced. Mm -hmm. But then scholars, scientists, everyone come in, BBC comes in again, and they look at what you did. And they tell you, oh, actually, he's talking about those few months in Iran. And you're like, oh, my God, yeah, that's what I'm doing, you know? So you just have to wait. It's just like planting trees, mm -hmm. trying to survive in such a wind, and then the fruit will be out there. That's my my understanding of it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, any other that you wanted to say? Yes, please. Um. I just want to say there's a big question for um, the theater associations, performing art associations out of Iran. There is a big question for them. How can us uh, people in diaspora mm -hmm. and also people who are in power in the stage of theater in the world can help uh, theater makers, performance artists in Iran. And talking about help is not about pity. It's not about only giving financial assistance, which is actually important, but it's also about how you can show this stage of power to the world, how you can keep them going. Uh, as Nasi mentioned, yeah, you have to keep this fire inside alive. There would be a day. This is a seed that you plant. And maybe we or people who are even more privileged than us as people in diaspora can actually help uh, nourish this tree. Mm -hmm. um, this is a big question. I think there should be panels and discussions about that asking uh, activists, performance art activists in Iran and theater makers in Iran, what do they need? Yeah. What can be helpful? Um, in the term of education, as Dr. Keshavaz mentioned, and also uh, Kayvan mentioned, uh, we can be of help. Uh, in the case of education, it is easy to make things hybrid and help. What about productions what about the reality of the liveness of theater um i think this is a big question which should be discussed and could be discussed yeah absolutely the, the role of diaspora could be very meaningful in, the, in support of the artists working inside Iran. Um, yes, Dr. Keshavars, you wanted to add something? Well, this, this last point is very relevant to um, places like Roshan Institute. Mm -hmm. And so I want to use the, the opportunity to learn as much as I possibly can. So one thing that um, could go wrong is to... Um, put certain artists in Iran on spot, talk with them and then make them targets of all kinds of um, false accusations and you know, all kinds of dangers. So we have to be very, very careful um, in the way we um, respect the space that they have over there. And so, what can be done has to come from inside to us mm -hmm. because it is only people who live there who know exactly what they're facing. The other thing is um, diaspora is, has a lot of um, potential and you know, I would 
very, very um, seriously uh, highlight the significance of the aspects of it that are academically committed. Because otherwise, before you know it, you are in all kinds of territories of political um, give and take and commitments and you know things that could again um, cause issues and misrepresent and so on and so forth. I'm I'm sure you you know exactly what I'm talking about. So um, you know some uh, what I can think about is that the hope that there will be um, wisdom coming out of um, people who live in the country and people like some of you who are outside but very connected with the inside so that we could actually know what could be useful rather than harmful in what we do. Thank you. Thank you. So um, with that, let's move on to Q&A. And I um, invite the attendees to please uh, write your question in the chat box. We also have Q and A box, so whatever that works for you. My colleague John and I will be monitoring the Q and A. Um, and while the questions come in, um, I would like to let me see. To also mention. Um, to actually ask Kayvon about um, I mean, your experience of moving between Iran and um, Europe mostly, uh, how um, we can actually create opportunities for you know, supporting artists based in Iran. Um, we have been, I mean, Nassim and I talked about giving some you know, online workshops you know, or even um, um, mentoring, you know, artists um, in their playwriting process and helping them to stage their work. If you could speak yeah, a little bit about that before I move on to the first question we received. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really mm, slippery question because uh, help uh, can mean many different things. I think, uh, <laughs> collaboration or uh, maybe asking what is needed or uh, seeing what uh, is missing here in Iran is very important. One thing that I am uh, quite certain about is that in the past decades, uh, no organization, no community, no institute has been allowed to become uh, established, become something uh, really productive. So this kind of collective, this kind of gathering people together and giving them what Azadeh talked about, uh, an association that can help, that can connect people together, that can uh, be something uh, supportive is missing inside Iran. And I don't think that it can be replaced by anything outside of Iran. But there can be temporary alternatives. For example, uh, unfortunately, the academic uh, structure of Iran is, I, I'm going to say that it's rotten. And I'm sorry to, to, to be direct, but it's rotten. So if you stay in there, you become rotten. And I've been there, Nassim has been there, Azad has been there. And uh, so it can, it can only be revolutionized, but it can, we can't ask people to stop. We can't ask people who are coming from uh, distant cities of Iran just to come to a university and they, maybe they are only allowed to come to Tehran because they are going to a, an official university. To so let's wait, let's wait your uh, many years and lose your young years and stop your career so that we can revolutionize something. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to give them alternatives. So we have to maybe give them opportunities 
to have a kind of uh, education, a kind of access to material. One of the things that can happen is access, which is very uh, stupid right now because uh, my internet access could be cut right now. So uh, how can that be access be uh, provided? It's something that needs to be discussed. It's something that needs to be uh, thought about, but it's not hell because I'm just talking about inside Iran and my centralized uh, presence and how uh, my net access network is really uh, broad and I can do go see that uh, talk with another person and some people in distant cities who have no access. So it's my responsibility also to provide that access. Without that access, access they have been phenomenal. They have been uh, much, much uh, more productive than I can ever be without the accesses that I have had. But it's also my responsibility to somehow give back or uh, return uh, some of the things that I have taken from all the off-center uh, places. And so this off-center and center relationship can be inside Iran and also can be between Iran and Europe and Iran and uh, other parts of the world. Absolutely, thank you. I, I, I would like to say that we need to share knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it's about sharing, it's not about teaching. We need to yes. educate each other. Uh, if there if there is a need for education, we need to give knowledge to each other if there is a need for knowledge. And this is just part of this organ which is needed. There are, this, this, is a, this is a body. We should make a body. And this body should start acting to give support. And this is just one organ of this body, but it is necessary. Thank you. Um, let's move on to that because we're in the interest of time um, to the question. Um, given the fact that theater is a narrative form of arts, do you think we could slash should consider our structural definitions of theater in this political time of Iran? So in a sense, it's a question about our understanding of theater um, in times that all the drama, quote unquote, is already taking place in the streets and by the people Perhaps we couldn't or shouldn't be trying to tell a story in the conventional sense, which is defined in theater. Um, perhaps our previous definition of theater isn't enough anymore. Uh, what do you have to address this question? Question slash comment. Uh, can I say something? Yes, please. I, I tend to think the whole world is about stories uh, and those who come up with better stories uh, and marry them more confidently rule others. A good lawyer, a surgeon, all the politicians, a handyman who, who finds out what's wrong with your pipe is all about the story that they put together. And sadly accepted from a playwright they it's about a better story it's not about a more true story um and that is not just about theater so if you have this type of brain then you can put the story inside the story you know so you can think how you're gonna find out how to write a story is just like what the handyman does some go, but my story is I change the form and I do that and I do this and I do this. And if you are good and you sell it confidently, you would rule over some people. And if you are like, but I don't care about the form. For me, it's about, you know, the content, this and that and that and that. This is where I honestly think it is very, that's beauty of art is, is, uh, is to be very personal. Um, and as soon as that's why I think any good artist, when scholars go for like, but we put you here, they become the word that K1 used, slippery. They're like, no, I don't want to be this. Maybe I do a dance piece now. So I don't think it is it is right if I want to put it down in one sentence for us to sit here and talk about the definition of theater. 
I can barely talk about, you know, the definition of the next paragraph in my next play. I, I cannot do that and I'm not interested in doing that. So it's very personal, but then yes, in the course of history, smart scholars like yourself and other colleagues here on the panel, they would put things together. Uh, it's just like some people want to make, some people gather trophies and talk about them. That's okay, I don't mind. Yeah, thank you. Any other response to that? Um, uh, yeah, Dr. Kesha was first. <laughs> I actually um, would like to respond to what Azadir said. Um, it is about sharing. It is not about teaching and mentoring. It is, I mean, I, I, I understand the term, the, the way Marjan used it, which is sometimes bringing in the medium that we work with more effectively being language and so forth. In that sense, we could be providing some structures and, and ways of dealing with this with things that could be helpful to our colleagues and, and friends in Iran. But um, I want to absolutely emphasize that, that it is about sharing and the amount that we take out of that by learning, by understanding. I mean, I'm going to go out of this panel thinking about so many things differently, not just theater but telling the stories, the way I have to tell stories about content, the significance of content, about a million different things. So um, you do enrich our lives academically, intellectually, personally, in many, many ways. And um, if we become, uh, and now I'm director of Roshan Institute, I'm speaking in that um, capacity, if we happen to, take a step that facilitates things, all the better, and we are absolutely delighted about it, but the way we think about it is sharing and learning from each other. And I'm truly excited to know that there is a community that could help us facilitate that kind of thing. I, I just wanna say that before the time runs out. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to answer Ava shortly. I think uh, art, one part of us, art is about self-expression. And if Ava or anyone as an artist feels like that, that the conventional theater or orthodox theater stage is not enough, that's true for this person. And he, she, or they should go seek for the aesthetic and politics which works for this artist. This is one thing, and I think we see it a lot on the street because what we see right now, as we mentioned in the beginning of this, uh, this um, very beneficial discussion for myself was, um, we talked about presentation. We talked about truthness. It is not contradictory with a story. It, it, there is no contradictions between presentation and stage. I would like to say there is not a super value for presentation uh, in compare with representation in the term of theatrical uh, terms. I would like to say what we are used to know as orthodox theater is what the state always defined for us. The state always defined a very special um, structure on the stage. The state always defined very limited aesthetics for the stage. But maybe right now artists can actually change that. So maybe the orthodox theater that we know is not enough. Maybe there are some artists, some theater makers who can actually make it different. But what we see on this in the streets is mostly performative events. Whatever we see in the street is not performance art. We see many performative events. We see many ex, many artistical expressions. We see many things like that in the state, in this in the scenery of the society. But as an artist. If Ava is an artist and she decides to make a performative event in the street and frame it 
inside a performing uh, event, a performance art, then it is changed to performance art. But not whatever we see is performance art. So it is actually at the end depending dependent on the artist it's uh, themselves, themselves yeah artistic intentionality actually plays a key role here um and thanks for differentiating that in a sense i think many artists many of us really want to move away from the binaries that you know have limited our minds and definitions and um, i hope that we address to some point about you know how we need to move away and aesthetically Iranian artists have been trying to move away from all these binaries from the state promoted you know narratives and conventions mm -hmm. to set free their aesthetics um mm -hmm. we have more more one more question um the creative college of students they're moving beyond metaphor is exciting as is transforming beyond the given semiotics the reclaiming of spaces for the theater to be shared at a scale can you Please talk more about the ways that you would like to collaborate with an equally complex diaspora equitably and what stories and dramaturgies uh, could be made possible. Um, so, question about collaboration. Hey, Fon, we leave it to you. Complex. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question uh, quite right, but uh, about the collaboration with, with, with mm -hmm. Diaspora X3, I'm going to just uh, say what I have in my mind is that it's really difficult to uh, find the similar language sometimes because mm -hmm. not because of uh anything that's missing from <laughs> one part or the other i was uh as i said in the yeah. beginning i was in europe for uh, one month just one month and when i came back i was like i was like coming back from a 20-year trip and i was like what's happening in iran and i, I couldn't understand that and maybe it also has something to do with the first question, which is uh, the concept of time and narrative uh, and their relationship together and how we are telling stories about things that have happened and maybe performance art is something that is always happening at the same time and theater narrative kind of it was retelling stories representing things and now we are in a state that is always happening inside the moment so these uh these different timelines that we are uh, experiencing these different timelines that is happening to us to one person who is living here i'm living here i'm experiencing and i'm i'm feeling a continuity but then i go out for one month and i come back and i feel disconnected so uh, I have to ask my friends, what's happening in the streets? What are people feeling? I'm not asking them what's happening. That I can find out in Telegram channels. That I can find out in Instagram. But the feelings that I could find by taking a taxi in Tehran, I miss. So this collaboration between diaspora and inside Iran, uh, it's a very big question for me artistically because uh, theater is about feeling, art is about feeling, and maybe we are feeling different things. So maybe just on top of my head, we sh should talk about this disconnection, this, mm -hmm. uh, these different feelings we have uh, because it's really dangerous for me to judge what for example, Azadeh is thinking right now, or for Azadeh to uh, judge what I'm thinking right now, or I'm going through. And it's easy for me to be here and say, I'm in the middle of everything, and I'm in the right. And what right do you have to talk about people in the streets in Iran, Azadeh? Uh, because I give myself that privileged uh, status of being oppressed and of being in danger, but it's completely uh, unfair to many people 
or outside and the other way is also uh, true. So I think discussions are really necessary. Mm -hmm. I think accepting that we are talking from different perspectives is really necessary. Right, absolutely. Thank you so much. And so I, I do hope that um, having such roundtables, virtual roundtables, help us share what we, we were talking about earlier about sharing our knowledge and experience and, and also um, strengthening, you know, the connection that you were talking about, uh, being more and more, you know, informed and updated about the feelings, yeah. receiving the updates and um, information. It should be going on and on, you know, it's not one. I hope that we continue the conversation, Missy, and thank you for highlighting that. Um, can I just add one quick comment to um, what Kayvon said? I think you just put your finger on it. So I have been really bothered by the fact that we hear these events put up and the motto is, let us be the voice of the people of Iran. And it just so, hurtful because to begin with, it assumes that they don't have a voice. And instead of trying to amplify that voice, taking it upon ourselves to be their voices, that is very presumptuous. And then secondly, all the interpretation that gets added to that. So I want to echo what Marjan just said. I think one of the answers are, gatherings like this, where we actually have people sitting around a table who come from different parts of the world and inside Iran and outside Iran and just hearing uh, from as many people as we can hear. I think I'll uh, promise to leave you <laughs> with the last few minutes that you have and no more comments, but I just, I just really have to say that because it's been hurtful to hear that motto time and again from different places. Thank you. So our time is up. Uh, we received a rather long comment. Um, I would like to comment on what yes, uh, Mazi Ashrafian mentioned. Yes, I think please. it's a very valuable thing. She's talking about lack of uh, sources, lack of knowledge about Iranian theater, and also about play plays, Iranian theater plays. We see Nassim, uh, how... Um, uh, successful he is with his plays. We see uh, Kayvan, how he is a well-known dramaturg here, how he is making his way through. So there is the potential, of course. And I, I think there, as I mentioned, there are, you know, rows of things. There are series of actions that could take. And I think what Marzi Ashrafian also mentioned is very valuable. The question is uh, toward Dr. Keshavars, but I just wanted to mention. Of course, I mean, it's about how we can facilitate the translation of plays and also how we can contribute to the production created in diaspora. Um, and uh, yeah, and Marzia is asking um, uh, how it can be realistic for those organizations or institutes to support. Okay, I, I looked at it, if, may, if I may uh, just answer very briefly. This is about a specialty. I'm very aware of the fact that at best, I could be a very enthusiastic receiver of great theater. That the judgments are left to my specialized colleague, as well as the experts that, like yourselves that, that are here. Um, we will be here to do as best as we can to support those um, ideas that come through that channel of a specialized, of knowledgeable people like those here. And uh, definitely Roshan Institute will, you know, what I can say is that this will be a focus of our attention to the best of our ability. That's like, I think the best that, that I could say. Okay, with that, Let's end um, the conversation, but for now, and let's hope that we continue this conversation. Um, I really 
thank you all the panelists, all the help, John Molan for his wonderful help, um, and uh, the participants uh, through HowlRound live streaming. Please stay in touch with us. Um, John just um, sent the, the Roshan email address on chat box. And um, again, thank you for um, sharing your thoughts. We hope that we continue the conversation and stay in touch with us. Yes, thank you. Bye, thank have you a great everyone. day or night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for the time. Thank you.